Next witness. Hello, my name is Jennifer Chambliss and I'm a single foster parent in Los Angeles County. I'm speaking in support of the Child Care Bridge Program. Mm -hmm. Last year, I fostered a baby boy for nine months while the county worked to reunite him with his two-year-old sister. Um, they found an extended family member who could care for them both, but needed immediate assistance with child care to do so because she was a full-time teacher. The funding was not available, which I knew because I'm, I also applied unsuccessfully for the subsidy and the siblings were not able to be reunited with each other or their extended family until summer break. He stayed with me four months longer than he would have um, if the subsidy had been available for them. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jen Rexroad and I'm a Yellow County foster parent. We love being foster parents and we plan on continuing to foster. I just stayed home um, for two years fostering um, an infant through toddlerhood and um, we would like to do that again, but um, childcare is an issue. Um, our uh, caregivers in our county typically go out of pocket about $500 a month um, per child and a subset is more. Um, many caregivers in our county are single parents and they're only able to accept um, placements if they do have child care in place. Um, some of our caregivers can have up to nine or 10 placements per year, infants, and so they quickly use up all of their sick and vacation leave. And um, many caregivers have um, left because they no longer have funds to um, to spend for child care. Thank you. Hi, my name is Donna Gill. I'm a foster parent here in Sacramento County. Um, I've been a foster parent for 14 years. Um, I've fostered all ages. I can tell you the hardest thing is to turn one down because you don't have available child care. Um, I know of foster parents that have tried using their sick time, their vacation time, and any other personal time off they can to try and get child care, and have ultimately had to request the child be moved to another foster. Um, I am in full support of this child care bridge program. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, my name is Irene. I actually am from Alameda County. I'm a foster parent um, and I'm in support of the Child Care Bridge program. Um, I'm also a licensed provider as well as my partner who works in children's services. Um, we work with a lot of high need in our work um, and children and, and also with our foster kids. Um, we made really conscious decisions to become foster parents, including buying a home in East Oakland in a zip code where there's the highest removal of kids in Alameda County. Um, we went to our foster parent training classes and we were the, the only two women of color in a room full of 30 people. And we find it imperative to be with kids and hold kids in our home who look like us and who we look like them and are able to provide them culture and family and neighborhood, um, what they call home and not being so far removed from there. Um, we picked up our third little one yesterday. <laughs> so my partner actually has him at work right now. Um, he's a week old. And we had to call our daycare provider and see if she's available because we both work full time. Um, but we've been paying out of pocket three to five hundred dollars a week um, in order to have somebody come into the home, you know, because we're not going to place an infant in a daycare facility, and most daycare facilities don't take young babies. So we want to continue to do this. We love this. We've had this is our third baby in eight months, and. Yet we we struggle back and forth with whether or not we can actually afford to do this, but we don't want to stop doing it. So I really uh, would appreciate it. I mean, these are our most vulnerable and highest need kids and communities um, to have your support. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lydia Perez. I'm a relative foster parent from Santa Clara County. I've been caring for my two-year-old second cousin for the last 10 months. I'm here to support the Child Care Bridge Program for foster children. It would have been easier for me to say yes, I will take the child if I had been offered a daycare voucher. The thought of paying full-time daycare for my baby was inconceivable. I needed a few months to readjust my budget, and it was the only reason I didn't take the child immediately. I completely regret that. It took three months to find child care at an affordable cost. During those three months, my child was placed into two different foster homes and had become despondent and thought to be deaf and autistic. He is now thriving in my care and no developmental or physical delays are showing. Due to unfortunate circumstances, the daycare that I 
found fell through and I was forced to take time off of work to find qualified care. It jeopardized my job. I was paying out of pocket and going into debt very quickly. I was on a long waiting list and was reluctantly thinking about giving my child back. The current system has been very difficult to navigate through. It took three months to figure out how the daycare center would be paid. Vouchers would have made it a lot easier since most daycare centers expect payment for the month prior to caring for the child. I was denied 20 times before I found a daycare that would accept my son. Every child deserves to be in a loving, stable home without the fear of being abandoned due to financial strains. I urge you to support the Child Care Bridge program so that working single parents like me can step up immediately. Good morning, Madam Chair and Senator Monning. My name is Jeannie Cho, and I'm here on behalf of LA County Supervisor Sheila Kuehl. And I'd like to thank you in particular for your leadership on AB 403, as well as Director Lightborn and his team, his, his A team, on the continuum of care reform. Um, it's really an exciting time to be in involved in child welfare right now. If the 90s were all about welfare reform with our days with Frank and the early 2000s on health care reform, now is the time for child welfare reform. And because of you, we, with CCR, we are poised to be a national leader on that effort. Unfortunately, however, um, for us to succeed, we, we must address, um, we, we, for, for it to succeed, we have to reduce our reliance on group homes. We must address the shortage, um, the crisis shortage of foster parents. The number of foster parents has declined by over half of what it was 10 years ago. And at the same time, we're seeing a disproportionate increase in the number of kids between zero to five in child care, in um, foster care. This effort is not only a bridge to longer term child care, it's also been a bridge between the child welfare worlds and the child care worlds. Believe it or not, those two worlds are very separate and this proposal was crafted under the leadership of, this, of the supervisor with partners like the Child Care Alliance of Los Angeles, Children Now, and the Alliance for Children's Rights. So I appreciate all of your support. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Jacqueline McCroskey, USC School of Social Work, here in support of the Child Care Bridge Project, um, building on the efforts that we've been making for the last decade or so in LA County to try to bridge the early care and education and child welfare systems. Uh, and very, very enthusiastic about the partnerships that have already been built. I just wanted to add that in addition to the um, resource families that this program would aid, the proposal also includes pregnant and parenting teens who are involved in the child welfare system and who have equal need of a bridge to child care. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Donna Snaringer on behalf of the Child Care Alliance of Los Angeles. We've worked very closely with Supervisor Kuehl and our partners in the child welfare system on trying to craft the beginning of some solutions to try to get better access to child care, and we look forward to continuing that work. Good afternoon. I'm Molly Dunn with the Alliance for Children's Rights, and I'm here speaking in support of the Child Care Bridge Program. As you just heard, the lack of affordable child care is a huge barrier to foster parent recruitment and retention. And it's really no wonder when we have otherwise willing relatives and foster parents um, who are forced to say no to taking in a child, especially a very young child, because they simply can't afford um, child care for that child. And the foster care payment that our families receive to meet the basic needs of the child, food, clothing, shelter, doesn't even come close to covering the child care costs. For a child zero to four, it's $688. 59 of those dollars are earmarked for babysitting and childcare. That's $59 a month. Meanwhile, the average cost of childcare for a zero to four year old is $803. The Child Care Bridge Program will provide these families with the ability to step up and care for our foster children who really need their uh, love and support and placement in their homes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Senator Monning, Martha Guerrero representing the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. And you heard from Director Browning on the urgency to establish the infrastructure for CSEC services. And also um, for the Bringing Families Home proposal, we are in strong support of the 10 million and appreciate the Senate's leadership in um, the No Place Like Home and in, in providing that funds. Thank you. Good afternoon, Tim Morrison with Children Now in strong support of the Child Care Bridge proposal. I just wanted to comment on the statewide-ness of this issue. 
when the legislature, as you know, appropriated funds last year to support county efforts at recruiting and retaining relative caregivers and foster parents, 28 of the counties that submitted proposals requested funds for child care specifically as a tool to recruit and retain more caregivers. Among the counties that requested child care support, LA County, of course, also San Luis Obispo, Monterey, Santa Clara, and Riverside. Um, unfortunately, due to the sheer magnitude of the number of requests for these funds, the State Department of Social Services had to release an all-county information notice in December saying, at this time, we, we cannot award funds for, for child care for foster families. Um, this is a targeted proposal that clearly meets a, a great need, as you've heard. Thank you. Good morning, Brenda Dabney with the Children's Law Center of California. I am based here in Sacramento in our Sacramento office and I represent um, over 3,000 children in Sacramento. Our LA office represents over 30,000 children in foster care. Um, not one of these proposals doesn't touch the lives of one of our foster care clients and um, for that reason we support them all, most especially the CSEC proposal as um, everyone knows. That is uh, an issue that is touching so many young people that um, we're just starting to discover and we support that in full. Thank you. I'm Gail Johnson Vaughn from Families Now. We work to remove the barriers that prevent children from achieving permanent families. I want to speak uh, also uh, in favor of all of these proposals and especially the training for child-centered specialized permanency services. And in that testimony, I also represent the California Association of Adoption Agencies. Those services are designed for and with the child to address their histories of trauma, separation, and loss to actually address the impairments in their life functioning that prevent them from achieving a permanent family. And if you can imagine, if you've had so many losses, you may come into the process of looking at permanency with a great resistance and require a lot of courage to even consider that. This is what makes these services different, and most of our counties and their partners do not yet know how to do it. So this training is critically important and will have a return of investment that you'll be very proud of. Please support it. Carolyn Stapleton, President of the California National Organization for Women. Yes, I agree that all of these uh, proposals are important, but uh, primarily uh, the CSEC uh, mandates uh, to protect our sexually exploited children is uh, a primary issue of concern for us. And also we support the bridge um, proposal for LA County and hope that you do go forward with that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Susanna Niffen with Children Now. Um, we also are in support of all of these amazing budget proposals. Um, as a parent, I find a way when it comes around to budgeting to find a way to meet all of my children's needs, health, education, and protection from sexual exploitation. I know that it's hard for you guys. You have more complicated choices than we do in our personal budgets, but I would just request that this committee push back against the fuller budget and ask for more funding for these children overall in the grand scheme of the budget. Thank you. Angie Schwartz with the Alliance for Children's Rights. In addition to the Child Care Bridge Program, just wanted to underscore really the need and our support for the Chafee proposal and making sure that all of our transition age youth can get those additional funds to support their college uh, education. Thank you, Madam Chair. Frank Meck, I just wanted to point out our support for all of the proposals and in particular identify our co-sponsorship of bringing families home and the Alameda County proposal with respect to uh, teenage pregnancy prevention for adolescents in foster care. Amy Lemley with the John Burton Foundation also wanted to express our strong support for each of the proposals in addition to the THP Plus proposal that I spoke to. Thank you. We will be holding uh, all those items open. Senator Mining, go ahead. No, no, it's Can I say that you said it, Bob? Can I say that you said it? You can channel me. I'm channeling Senator Mining because he doesn't want to make this comment publicly. <laughs> I, and and I, I, share your, I share your sentiment, Senator Monning. Uh, I, I want to thank um, all of you who came to provide public testimony. We both would, as well as those who brought forward very reasonable, focused, appropriate investment proposals. 
many of which um, simply add the critical resources to implement policies that this body has undertaken and identified as priorities. So thank you very much. Um, like I said, I think they were, they're reasonable in price, very well thought out, and uh, we understand uh, the importance of investing in the fragile um, populations that we have been talking about here today. Please, Senator Monning. And, and I'm glad to add a comment to the chair, just thanking everybody who's made the effort to be here today. You know, in the larger scheme, these don't amount to huge budget uh, items uh, dollar-wise, but you've made it clear what good it could do in our communities. So again, I just join the chair in thanking you for being here. And we definitely hear you loudly and clearly. Thank you. And I think as we've said, Senator Mining, previously in this committee, that, that we're clear that our state budget um, is a, a, a values document. Um, and as one of the members of the public suggested, um, these are certainly issues we would prioritize in our own homes for our own family and children. And we're clear that we have uh, the responsibility as policymakers to make these critical resources available to those um, we are responsible for. So thank you. We will move on now to the third section of, our, of part A of today's agenda. Uh, and again, Department of Social Services, Child Welfare Services. Item 5180. We've got two issues before we move on to part B of the agenda. Oversight of the much discussed thus far, or, or, or much refer, often referenced, the continuum of care referendum and its implementation. Look forward to hearing that update, Director. On a panel after this, got you. And uh, issue two will be the budget change proposal, funding continuum of care referendum implementation. After we hear from the department, we'll have a panel that will be addressing, um, will be providing comments on the implementation of the CCR. We'll hear from Welfare Directors Association, the LAO, and Finance. Director. Thank you. Again, um, we're back. Uh, Will Lightborn, Director of the Department of Social Services, Greg Rose, our Deputy Director for Children Family Services, and Sarah Rogers, who's our Bureau Chief for the Continuum of Care Reform Implementation. Um, CCR really brings to fruition a shared vision um, that's been developing over the past decade, and it, it's a vision that's been sort of gestated by legislators, by our practitioners in the counties, by our very best provider networks, and by youth themselves. And it's fundamentally, we need a out-of-home care approach that is a continuum, that is child-focused and looks at services through the eyes of a child, um, is based on the premise that children should live in homes and that the families that are caring for them should have access to the services they need to be able to care for them effectively, that when a individual child for a specific reason for a clear therapeutic purpose needs a 24-7 environment. It should be short-term, note not time-limited, but short-term in that it should have a defined service plan and it be reviewed at specific intervals to ensure that the child's needs are being met and that the child still needs that level of, of service and care. It should have um, the step down with services components that allow the child to move back towards home-based care, either in therapeutic foster care or ITFC or um, relative kin care with preference to relative and kin, um, and that it have a strong quality component, which in the case of the short-term residential treatment programs of the future will require that they be accredited, certified, um, have clear program statements that define what it is they are to accomplish. And in the case of foster family agencies, again, accredited um, and potentially certified if they are going to be um, Medi-Cal contract agencies, 
and a sort of a new standard of home-based care, which we call the resource family approval system, that will sort of essentially ensure that we are clear that the family can care for the particular child and that it is, um, they are supported appropriately. And ultimately, that the family voice be built into the process of developing case plans, um, looking at placement needs, and looking at the meeting the child's individual needs, and that through the child-family teaming process. Um, there's the recognition that they, this requires investment by the state um, at, the, at the beginning of this process, that it has new activities that run parallel to old activities, that those things that could potentially be savings in the future won't be realized instantly, and that therefore um, the, the, the sort of the front end um, investment is necessary. There is a huge, I, I almost said it the other way with the why, there's a huge amount of cross-system planning now underway um, between uh, all of the players that you can imagine touch the issue. Um, in particular, there's been very close work with the counties around sort of refining assumptions for service needs and the cost for service needs, and we expect to see those um, refined uh, assumptions and, and, and estimates in, in the, the, the May revision. Um, so let me turn to the questions that are sort of posed on page 26, and, and then we can, as a team, respond to any other questions that, that arise. Um, in terms of sort of the current implementation effort, there's what I would call an extraordinary degree of mobilization at the county level around this, um, both in the child welfare space, in the uh, children's probation, juvenile probation area, and with our mental health partners, and, and a great deal of, of dialogue underway there. Um, in many counties, I would say implementation's actually started. Um, it's not just the planning. We, um, Mr. Rose and I were visiting one of our largest counties a few weeks ago, and one of the requirements under CCR is that counties that operate shelters have to sort of refocus them as transitional short-term facilities for no more than 10 days. The county that actually operates, I think, the largest shelter in the state sort of told us when we were down there a few weeks ago, hey, we're now down to 10 days. I mean, they're, they've done it. They've gotten the approach, the, the, the logic, the program view makes sense for them. Um, the most critical things this year um, depend on where you are. Um, the most critical thing for the counties at this point um, is the resource family approv approval process, which has gone through pilot counties, now has extended to a second cohort of counties, and then goes statewide effective January 1st, 2017. So there's a great deal of effort in both preparing, working with the caregiver community, working with licensing staff, working through the process of, of being ready for RFA implementation. Now, not all homes have to become RFA homes effective January 1st. The process has to be underway. And in fact, current foster homes, relative homes, et cetera, have a several year window in which they can be grandfathered in. But the counties have to be implementing the new process starting January 1st. It's the, implementing the new process as they recruit new homes? Yes. And, and then, and then right. there'll be kind of a, a staggered rollout for exactly. existing homes? Work backwards. Got it. Um, the foster parent retention, recruitment, and support strategies, um, all counties have well, 57 to 58 counties have begun the implementation already. Um, the one county that hasn't is very small um, care population. Um, the, a number of probation departments have also started 
um, th their planning process for for the, what we call thippers. Um, and the, this will be sort of an effort that continues and accelerates um, into the first few years of the process. Clearly at the beginning, the focus is on those youth in lower level congregate care who we want to see step down um, promptly into home-based care, and then it will sort of continue beyond that. Child-family teaming, um, again, this is not a new experience for counties. I mean, it's the, both as part of the KDA settlement, which has now been underway for several years, um, as well as core practice models that the counties have been working on. CFTs are already part of their activity, and in this coming year, we're going to see that expand um, to being sort of the norm in, uh, for, 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 for most cases. At the department level, um, we this year have to focus on the accreditation process for getting um, our, those residential programs that are going to become STRTPs um, into that accreditation cycle. Um, it's, uh, we're, we're on a separate track going to sort of modify a, a component so that there isn't a requirement to be accredited before they can be licensed as an SDRTP. Mm -hmm. it, that is sort of just a timing issue. Part before the horse. Right. Um, and then similarly, the program statement approvals, the uh, work on sort of starting the process of getting them into the new system. Between the departments, um, and the, by the departments I mean Department of Healthcare Services and Department of Social Services, an enormous amount of work going on around defining and clarifying the process for certification of FFAs and SDRTPs um, and the contracting for uh, in pretty much all cases for SDRTP and in many cases for foster family agencies so that um, specialty mental health services can be provided by those providers um, at county request in, in, in those locations. So th that's sort of the uh, priority for the immediate um, um, cycle. Does the department expect to be able to implement all the activities? Yes. I mean, there. It, it's, it, I don't want to minimize this. This is a huge lift. But all of the pieces are in place and moving. The collaboration deepens almost by the minute. And it's, I, I think everyone is deeply committed to this. In terms of the January 1st date, I just want to, there's sort of a perception in some parts of the universe that January 1st, every group home closes down. No, no, no. That, that is the way we kind of talk about it. Yeah, I know, but that's not the way that's it, not. it intended to happen. I mean, the, the intention is that to the extent that it, the resources are now online for allowing children to step down, that'll start right away. But on a case-by-case -case basis, we can issue you know, exemptions for particular facilities to stay open for a longer cycle, both to accommodate supply, you know, home resource family supply, but also to accommodate the reality that some youth who are almost at the end of their dependency may just simply prefer to end where they are. Um, we don't want that to be the outcome, and we certainly don't plan to take no as an, you know, as an answer lightly, but we also have to respect the youth themselves and uh, deal, deal with them appropriately. If I could expand on the question um, with regard to um, you implementing all of kind of the ramp up activities by January 1, 2017, um, what is your vision about a date or year by which it would be fully implemented and fully executed and the culture shift really haven't happened statewide. Is that five years, 10 years? So, to be honest, I'm not sure we ever expect it to be done, 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 done. That this part of what we're doing is moving into a learning culture that will continue to 
hopefully be improving itself constantly. The sort of the but heavy there lift. There will be a point in time right. where the, the ratio of group home population versus foster family home population. Certainly we would expect to be that to be done by 20, within a five year window. Okay. Um, and as you know, on the sort of shelter approach, we've got a date of I think 2022 when we'll come back to the legislature and talk about is, you know, what role the shelters need to play going into the future. Um, rates package, we expect that to be released with the May revision. Um, as you know, it's sort of an administrative process. We're now, you know, going with Department of Finance through a lot of the details. The structure of the rates package has been shared with our stakeholders, but not necessarily sort of the specific dollar amounts. And that's something we're going to be working on over literally the next days and week. Um, in terms of reports uh, to the legislature, the, the AB 403 requires a report in, in January 2017. What I anticipate we will do is, as we do, for example, with what well, we started the day with child welfare service new system is sort of schedule regular leg staff briefings um, so that um, the interested policy and budget staff stay fully up to date with um, and, and the, the, in turn the legislators um, are up to date. In terms of the last question, update and conversations, it's Sarah and I were sort of De debating the appropriateness of the word relentless, um, <laughs> constant, hourly. Um, ending. But I, I don't want to put it, you know, in, in, a, in a negative. Everyone is really understands that we have to be embedded with each other, literally to the point that, for example, the counties have a staff person of, of CWDA embedded on the 14th floor with Sarah and her team. So they're constantly in that process. We do by weekly calls with the county directors directly covering it. We're gonna be adding the mental health directors and probation chiefs in that process. We do regular, we have a number of work groups that meet sort of constantly. We have a county state team, which is meeting this afternoon and which Sarah has to go and run. Um, so it's, it is a lot of engagement. It, it, I anticipate there will be yet more as it, you know, and particularly as we start moving deeper into the implementation phase, then that stakeholder conversation and dialogue will move from the conceptual to the how did that really work? And do we need to change this or tweak that? Throughout all of these sort of engagements, we've been really fortunate to have both CYC very directly involved in the process and, and other youth um, voices very present. So with that, um, did I see if Greg or Sarah want to?